Elena Shiki graduated from Cambridge University with a master's degree in biochemistry and is now studying for her PhD at the Cancer Research UK, Cambridge Institute. Eleanor is the person behind the Shiki Science Show, a popular YouTube channel where she covers longevity and other topics with her deep knowledge of biochemistry. With that, let me start the interview. Eleanor, welcome to Modern Health Fan. It's a pleasure to have you on today. Oh, hi, uh, thank you for having me on. It's uh, great to speak with you. Thank you. So uh, you produced the Shiki Science Show on YouTube, uh, I, which I think is a great resource. It's like my go-to resource if I want to try and understand how things are working. And I, I love your uh, the cartoons and your explanatory style. It, it really makes sense. So I'm sure many of the people are familiar with your channel, uh, but could you kind of introduce the channel and, and kind of what are your goals with producing this? Yeah, sure. And um, thank you. Um, so the Shiki Science Show, um, I guess I got used to saying it now, <laughs> um, is something I created about two and a bit years ago now. Um, and it actually initially extended from a blog that I used to write called a Shiki Science blog. <laughs> um, have a bit of an obsession with my surname. Um, and it, basically the idea was to um, initially just summarize research papers that I'd read and found interesting and kind of create a kind of database of um uh, summarized versions of these papers in a way that was explained that anyone could try and read it and understand the key points of a paper but also kind of for myself because obviously I read a lot of papers and most of the time I just forget it um and it's good to have a kind of I know like a collection of uh, resources where I've summarized that information in a way that I already know that I can understand so that at a later time point I can go back and then uh reread that information yeah, I mean, I had the blog and no one ever really read it. <laughs> and so um, I will say I want to expand my reach. And so I always wanted to go to YouTube. And then the, the question was, how would I do that? And when would I have the time to do that? Uh, so it wasn't until I finished my master's and I had a nice like four month gap between that and starting my PhD, where I was like, OK, this is the time where I'm going to learn how to create videos and finally make the, the move to YouTube still with the same idea of just trying to summarize research papers and so yeah I spent that time just finding the best way to uh, translate the blog into video format and for me the natural thing that came to me was just drawing animations and just recording myself doing doing that in the process um, and so that's basically where the the YouTube side came from and then in terms of the topics, initially, I kind of just spoke about things that I found interesting. So I knew my PhD was going to be on cellular senescence, which I, I assume we'll come back to later mm -hmm. in this conversation. And I mean, that's linked to a variety of different processes within the body. So it's just using my biochemistry background and just my general curiosities about neuroscience, the microbiome, um, circadian rhythms, just anything that I found fascinating and just trying to summarize the latest research and present it in a way that other people could understand and then I would just say like the rest is history from there really I just tried to do the same sort of thing um and obviously I tried to now I've got more of an audience try to summarize stuff that they also will probably find interesting and get them involved in the conversation as well so that's I guess where the the shift has headed a bit more towards aging more generally because there's a lot of interest in it at the moment obviously I'm, I myself are interested in it as well so yeah that's kind of the backstory. Right. I was going to ask about kind of why you start focus on aging and you see that is kind of that's because where the audience is or where, what your audience interest is. Um, I guess to some extent, but I was already making that content even on the mm. blog I used to have because it was actually somewhat part, a small part of my uh, master's uh, degree. Mm. And for, for me, like the, the my first interest in the aging field was from a biochemist perspective as to wow what is this complicated process that seems to be integrating all these different biological pathways um together so it was more from like a curiosity perspective as opposed to I because I'm, I'm young I'm not too worried about uh well I guess you start to worry about these things but there wasn't anything it was definitely more the biochemical side that got me interested in it so while we're talking about aging, so there's there are several theories of aging, right? Um, I just wonder, so which one do you favor and why? Because like I have my thoughts on this, but mm. I'm really interested to understand what you think. Yeah, and I mean, I think it's a really 
interesting question. I always get asked it and I never really know what to say. And I'm pretty certain my answer also always changes. But I think ultimately, I think of aging as uh, the accumulation of damage. And then the question is, um, what is that damage? Um, one primary area that I kind of study a bit in my lab is DNA damage um, and how mutations accumulate with age. So the classic example being cancer, um, which in majority of cases is age associated and cancer is a genetic disease. Um, but then there's also other types of damage. It could be mitochondrial mutations. It could also be misfolding of proteins. Um, and that's also like uh, can cause aggregates, which is also can cause further damage. Um, then you have like senescent cells as a kind of high level phenomenon of damage. <laughs> um, so I think it's a combination of damage with also like a loss of homeostasis. So in biology, you get a lot of these like negative uh, feedback mechanisms where you have like oscillating events where something happens, the cell realizes that it's not quite optimal and then it fixes things and it goes back to a set point and it's constantly like oscillating around the set point. And I guess it's hard to, it's not really been proven, but I, I see uh, aging as kind of a way of being less able to regulate around the set point and also maybe um, changes in like the phase and the frequency of these oscillations. Another way I like to think about it is like um, uh, Jenga, like the, the blocks, um, mm -hmm. where like you have to, you know, you accumulate damage over time. It's the same as like pushing out the, the individual blocks and over time it gets a little bit more fragile. Um, and whilst our biological systems have ways of being able to slot those like blocks back in, eventually over time you do get gaps and it becomes less stable and the, the body is like so systemic and interconnected that I think, yeah, I, I really can't summarize it. And also like, <laughs> there's still so much disagreements and confusion in the field about what is aging and what are the major causes that, yeah, I, I definitely don't have the answer, but that's just my understanding. Right. Yeah, no, I agree that absolutely makes sense. Uh, it's just, it just seems predictable to me. Um, it's like, if you look at the way the, the estrogenic clock works, it seems very predictable and it continues to be predictable. So it, it doesn't seem random. I mean, it seems like programmed or th th there's some, yeah, like it's it's set to go in a certain direction. Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting point about, yeah, how we can actually use these so-called aging clocks to actually see um, how things change as we age and epigenetic clocks is a good example. Um, yeah, the, the big questions around epigenetic clocks at the moment is what is like the mechanistic underpinning of these different methylation changes that we see as we age. Um, it's also interesting to look at other organisms and think about how are they aging as well. Um, as like some, like I think worms, so C. elegans, like proteomic damage is more important to them than like other species like mice, which mainly get cancer. So it's maybe more of a genetic cause of aging. And then I do think, I mean, as much as we might think it's programmed, I still think there could be some like stochastic uh, noise that's also part of the system. But yeah, I think this is where like the, the height of the interest is at the moment. And I'm sure we'll, we will start to get some of these answers uh, to these questions. But yeah, 